Hi, good evening, Vikas. Are you there? Good evening, sir. Hi, how are you? I'm good, sir. How are you, sir? I'm all right. Thanks. I'm all right. Yes, thanks for the good wishes, everybody. So today we have, uh, Vikas, uh, I have, uh, I, I plan, see, there are two things that we can do. In fact, there are three things that are on the agenda at the moment. One is, of course, to finish the cardiac graphs, all the cardiac graphs that we have done last week. We have those to be finished. That's number one. Then we have a half-finished ECG lecture, which needs to be finished. And then I've got a whole series of thoracic graphs and a whole series of esophageal graphs, the manometry graphs. So my suggestion today would be that I think in the first half, we'll do it in two halves of the, of the day. One hour we'll do first the IABP thing. I think we'll discuss uh, intraaortic balloon pump and do all the tracings of an intraaortic balloon pump. Uh, yes, and then uh, we will stop there for the cardiac graphs. Uh, and then we will finish the ECT lecture. That's my thinking. I think we've, you know, the traces are quite good and they, we need to understand the ECT while it is uh, hot. Yesterday we did the whole talk on ECT. So today if we finish all the tracings of ECT, then it'll be good. And then the thoracic graphs, uh, I will do it in another lecture, you know, in, in next week or something. I think that's the way we should do it. Is that okay with you guys? Or, or do you want me to do ECG now and finish off the first half as the ECG and then second half we do IAPP? Uh, there are yeah. two or three ways we can run the show and I'm just sort of trying to understand what is the need of the audience. Either way, it is fine, sir. Okay. Yeah, so A lot depends on what the people want. So. Uh, I, I feel that we should only do IABP today and the tracing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because we have, we have done the cardiac cycle. That is why I want to finish the yes, IABP sir. with the cardiac cycle. And then, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. you know, we leave the thoracic graphs for our next lecture and we'll finish the ECGs uh, as the second half. So, first half, we will do the IABP, just understand how the yes, IABP works. So, the, you yes, know, the sir. cardiac cycle and IABP fall together. And then the yes, second. Sir. I will finish the ECG tracings. We've still got some ECG tracings to do. And that will finish the yes, lecture sir. for today. And the thoracic graphs, uh, everything we can do as a separate lecture. Okay? Yes, I, I think we will yes, do. All right. So now let me give you the, uh, let me give you the control and I'll start the recording. Uh, is it, it's already five o'clock. So record on this computer. Uh, number two is make you I know I, I need to change the sharing scene. So I start sharing my screen. So you'll see the blue screen. And then number three. Yes, sir. To make you the, uh, make you the uh, host. So now you have control, yeah? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, all right. So can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Blue screen, sir. All right, so good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session of uh, Thoracic Gurus. And uh, the bottom line is, again, we are going to continue from where we left off uh, last week. We did two lectures last week. Uh, in the first lecture on, the, on Saturday or Sunday, I did all the cardiac graphs, and I tried to cover cardiac cycle. And then I got a feedback that uh, a lot of people did, were struggling with the details of the cardiac cycle. So during the week, I did a second lecture uh, to redo the cardiac cycle. And anybody who wants to uh, listen to the second lecture, because it was not relayed on the IX platform, uh, you can actually go onto the YouTube uh, Thoracic Gurus and it has been uploaded to that uh, platform. So the cardiac cycle now is a standalone lecture separately available on Thoracic Gurus, and you will find it very easily. And so because we did all the tracings and all uh, in great detail uh, last week, uh, my suggestion is that today we should just look at intraaortic balloon pump uh, because the aortic tracings are the same as you get with uh, 
intraaortic balloon pump. So this is a good time for us to understand the intraaortic balloon pump because we've just done the cardiac cycle. So we'll do first half, we'll do the intraaortic balloon pump. And then the second half of the lecture, uh, we will finish our ECGs because yesterday we finished the rhythm and we have not done conduction defects and we have not done MIs and things like that. So I think we need to practice the ECGs as well. So we will do that. And there is a whole lot of thoracic tracings, uh, which, is a, which is there in this lecture. I've prepared it all, but my suggestion is we'll do that as a separate lecture on another day. Uh, the thoracic tracings are all the pulmonary, the lung functions, the PFTs, uh, all of the balloon uh, pressure changes within the lung, pressure changes within the pleura and things like that. They are very important to learn. Uh, we have taught them in the past, but it will be a good uh, exercise for us to repeat that. Now, the other thing that I, I really want everybody to understand is that this uh, lecture is always designed as a one-to-one -one interactive lecture. So if you haven't got a pen and paper, this lecture is completely useless. So please uh, sit with pen and paper. Uh, remember your 200 page notebook. Uh, please draw whatever I ask you to draw in the 200 page notebook so that we can then correlate uh, our findings with this. So before I start any graphs on IAPP, I'll just talk a little bit about the IAPP. Now my first question to everybody is, can you draw the IAPP? Just draw the anatomy of an IAPP, which means starting from the monitor, go backwards all the way up to the tip of the balloon pump. So I want you to draw all the various parts of a balloon pump. It's very important to understand how the balloon pump is constructed. So I'm going to give you one minute uh, to draw. It's got to be a rough drawing, uh, but just tell me what are the various parts of a balloon pump. And then I'll show you and I'll discuss it all in, in, in a minute. So quickly draw it. Uh, just the various balloons. And when you're finished, just tell me, yes, sir, we are ready. Start with the helium cylinder and work your way up all the way to the tip of the balloon pump. I, I want you to draw it. That's the only way to learn this, okay? Let me know when you're ready. Ready or not? It doesn't have to be an artist's representative. Just a little quick a diagram. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So this is what the balloon pump looks like. If ever in the exam you're asked to draw, which sometimes we do on, an, an, on a Viva table. So you must uh, draw the various parts of the balloon pump and start from the uh, helium uh, thing. So helium thing is connected to the monitor. This is the monitor, the whole machine, okay? So this is just a representation of the machine. And the machine is connected by this to the, uh, to the distal end of the balloon pump. This is the distal end, that's the proximal end. At the distal end, you will have two outlets. One is, of course, for pressure tracing and for helium to go in. And the second, second uh, one is for the helium to go in and the second one is for uh, the pressure tracings. So this transducer gives you the pressure tracings, okay? Uh, you do have uh, a sheet here. So there is always a sheet so that you can push and pull the balloon uh, even after you've inserted it. If the position is not accurate or you're not happy, uh, with the positioning of the balloon pump, there is always a sterile sheet. So this sterile sheet has to be shown. Uh, this fixation thing is there to fix the balloon pump into one place once you are happy with the position. Inside there is the inside challenge. This is the lumen of the balloon pump. And on the outside of it is the, is the 30 to uh, 60 ml balloon, okay? So there is an internal catheter and there is a balloon at the tip of the catheter. At the tip of the balloon pump is always a radio opaque tip. And uh, can somebody tell me why you have a radio opaque tip at the tip? 
Just quickly tell me why you have upper end position. Should be below the position. Screen. That's correct. You need to be able to see it on an X-ray to know the position of the balloon pump. It's very, very, very important. Okay. And if you do a transection of the thing, then this is how it is. So this is the helium lumen of the thing. This is the blood lumen. There is always another uh, thing in there for blood lumen because all the tracings will come via the blood lumen. Yeah. So this is the and the French can be. It is different sizes now. It is available uh, on depending on. Uh, what you are putting in, the sizes can go up or down. So it doesn't uh, matter the size really. It's, it has to be appropriate for that patient, okay? So this is how you put in the balloon pump, okay? This is where the balloon pump stays and it comes to the left of the left subclavian artery. Always the tip has to be, the tip is very, very important that the tip must be beyond the left, sub, uh, before the left subclavian artery because you're coming retrograde. Okay, it's coming retrograde. So the tip should not cross the left subclavian artery. Okay, so now my question to you is, uh, and everybody, one by one, you can take the question. How do you confirm the presence of a balloon pump? How do you confirm that the distance is correct? Uh, whoever is there, uh, because just ask people, I can't see who's there. Who wants to ask? Uh, because you want to take it, if you want to tell us, or, or anybody can take it. Fitun can take it, let Fitun take it. Fitun, do you know how you confirm the tip of the balloon pump? Uh, sir, we have to check it with TE, that would be the best. With what? Uh, transesophageal. Okay, transesophageal. Yeah, okay, so that's mm -hmm. one way. What else? What are the other ways you can do? Chest X-ray, you can do by chest X-ray as well. Very good, excellent. What else? Uh, Transthoracic echocardiography might also give you Anand? Yeah, okay, difficult, but yeah, yeah, possible. Yeah. What else? Um, I don't know if you can do it blindly just by measuring, but that would not be an ideal idea. Yeah, yeah, but that, that is the starting point. When you insert it, you actually do make measurements uh, of the chest wall. So start off always with a physical measure, and then you confirm by, uh, by investigation. So yeah, what else? One more thing I, I'm looking for. You said chest X-ray, but there is another thing that you can use. Arterial tracing, sir. Uh, yes, arterial tracing, but uh, uh, we are talking about investigation. Left, head, uh, left radial uh, pulsations. Uh, yeah. More than that, fluoroscopic screening. Okay, so while you are there, you can on table. Uh, while you are inserting, you can have a fluoroscopic screening. So let's go through all the things. Okay. So measurement is the first thing. When you start, you always measure and you measure from the insertion point to the umbilicus because that's the angle. And then you measure the distance from the umbilicus to the sternal angle. So that is a standard uh, measurement in a patient when you want to measure the distance on a balloon pump. And there is always uh, markings on the balloon pump which will tell you exactly how much distance you have gone into the chest from the femoral point of insertion. The other one is the fluoroscopic guided insertion. So while you are inserting or after inserting on an ICU bed, it might be difficult to get a chest X-ray. And if you have a C-arm fluoroscopy there, you can just uh, do that because these are sick patients. And the last thing you want to do is lift the patient and put an uh, X-ray plate behind the patient. So if you have a C-arm, then you can do that. Uh, of course, you can use a TOE. TOE is extremely good, uh, very, very sensitive. Probably one of the most sensitive uh, things that will tell you that the tip, and it should lie about two centimeters distant to the origin of the left subclavian artery. Can somebody tell me why should it lie two centimeters distant? What's the problem if it comes ahead? Quickly, quickly, come on, quickly. Somebody come in. It will obstruct the flow to the... Yeah, absolutely. So if it comes uh, proximal, it can obstruct the flow and you can get ischemia, okay? And you can get vertebral ischemia, you can get spinal ischemia, you can get cerebral ischemia. So it's very important to make sure that the positioning is very accurate. The chest X-ray is also a good thing. And on a chest X-ray, you look at the level of the left main bronchus, okay? So the tip, you try to place it such that it is at the level of the left main bronchus, or it should be somewhere around the second or the third intercostal space. Sometimes they give you a chest X-ray and they ask you to identify the tip of the uh, of the uh, IABP, and and they will ask you the question: How you know is it is it well placed or is it not well placed? Now on a chest X-ray you don't know, so you have to use these two markings. You have to lose, either say it is, should be at the level of the left main bronchus, or it should be somewhere between the second and third intercostal space. Okay. 
when uh, pressure transducing, somebody said that. So pressure trans transducing will actually tell you that it is it is an arterial position, and the position uh, you're getting a good trace means you're in a good position. Uh, and uh, sometimes it is it's not a good idea, but uh, you can actually retract. Uh, you can over push it, so get further into the into the aorta and then retract back to see. Uh, what is happening with the left subclavian? So you feel the left uh, radial artery pulse, and uh, you know you'll get obliteration of the radial artery pulse, and then when you push back, uh, the pulse will reappear. But that's not a good technique because that is actually that will cause uh, problems. So that's not a good technique, but it is something that is described uh, in the books. Now, the, so this concept, this picture I have bought in. slightly blurry picture, but it's a very important picture to understand the benefits of an IAB. So first and foremost is is that this is normal flow. This is systole. Okay, the first picture is systole. The second picture is diastole. So in systole, the balloon is deflated. Okay, so normal pressures are going. So when the heart contracts, there is the blood coming out, blood going here and there. The, we know that the most of the uh, coronary uh, blood flow happens in diastole. We drew the cardiac cycle and we drew the coronary. Uh, the blood flows in the coronary and we know most of the coronary blood flow happens in the in diastole so when you inflate the balloon in diastole okay it has to be timed in such a way that the balloon inflates in diastole so when you inflate the balloon in diastole what it does is this column of blood which is there gets pushed back there is an increased pressure here and it pushes this column of blood backwards so there is increased cerebral flow so the left subclavian the carotids will have increased flow and more importantly this pressure will then increase the flow in the coronaries so that's the first advantage so in diastole you get increased coronary flow because the balloon comes into the action and the other important thing is not just that the other important thing is now because you have emptied this whole aorta in diastole the pressure in the aorta has gone down because the blood is now flown out so when you come back to systole and you drop the balloon down the moment you drop the balloon down the pressure in the aorta is less so the myocardium has to make less effort to contract and eject the same amount of blood into the aorta do you understand so there are two benefits one is the diastolic benefit where you get diastolic augmentation of blood flow to the coronaries and the cerebral circulation but more importantly there is a reduction in the vascular resistance as a result of which the myocardium in systole has to work less to push the blood and open the aortic valve and cause forward flow so did you understand that so there are two benefits not just one benefit and that is why in the exam whenever they say you must talk about both the benefits not just about diastolic augmentation but it's also a systolic benefit so the balloon inflates in diastole it displaces the aortic blood both into the systemic circulation and the coronary circulation so below the balloon it pushes the blood down into the renals and the and the uh, rest of the body but in front of the balloon it pushes it back into the cerebral circulation and into the coronary so both benefits before the balloon after the balloon the balloon deflates before systole so as soon as the balloon deflates the pressure in the aorta goes down that is a important understanding when there is the so there is reduced aortic pressure at systole so diastolic augmentation thus improves blood flow but more importantly systolic augmentation meaning it's more like reduction of the pressure actually decreases the afterload so the pressure the the svr goes down because that column of blood is now gone into the circulation so the lv workload goes down this is important concept to understand so there is a reduction in the in the work of the myocardium as a result of which the myocardial 
oxygen consumption goes down okay so it takes less effort for the heart to work so this is a sick heart the heart is struggling and because of that because of the sick heart uh, you want to reduce the oxygen oxygen consumption of that muscle so you reduce that systolic pressure and so it reduces the mean left ventricular ejection uh, pressure and decreases the duration of the isovolumetric contraction remember the isovolumetric contraction duration completely depends on the equalization of the ventricular and the uh, aortic pressure remember the uh, aortic valve is closed the isovolumetric contraction happens the pressure in the ventricle has to overcome the pressure in the aorta to open the aortic valve but because that balloon pump is reducing the pressure in the aorta so the isovolumetric contraction does not continue for a longer it shortens the isovolumetric contraction and because it shortens the isovolumetric contraction the myocardial oxygen consumption goes down so for the same amount of ejection fraction the heart has to work less is this concept clear have you understood these two benefit in fact three benefits yes or no so the second point is the slight decreasing the mean lv ejection pressure that I yeah yeah because because the lv has to overcome aortic pressure in a cardiac cycle in an isovolumetric contraction yeah okay okay, okay then, yes sir the lv has to overcome the aortic, aortic pressure, pressure for the aortic valve to open but if the aortic pressure has gone down the mean left ventricular ejection pressure does not have to be so high to overcome the uh, aortic pressure you yes, understand so it yeah, actually reduces the left ventricular ejection pressure to create the same amount of ejection fraction so you are not reducing the ejection fraction you are reducing the work that is needed to do on the myocardium to open the aortic valve okay all right so let's quickly go through indications now anybody wants to tell me three or four indications for a balloon pump quickly is it making sense this way of teaching is it okay everybody is understanding yes sir okay. yes sir so somebody come in and give me three or four indications uh, sir acute mi that is not being resolved by the drugs okay uh, then it could be a failing heart uh, low ejection fraction with the acute, uh, acute mr uh, <coughs> then uh, it could be a vhd uh, post uh, m uh, post mi vhd just to stabilize the bridge the patient up to surgery okay so let me now go through in a systematic way you're right you're absolutely right but let's go through the thing in a systematic way so first one is no choice but pump you you have to use a balloon pump because the heart is not is not working the first and foremost in that is failure to come of bypass okay that's the first one so whenever you start talking about high bps you should say first is no choice but pump so when you are operating in theater and you want to get the patient of bypass and the myocardium is so badly damaged that you cannot come of bypass then you put in the balloon pump to reduce the oxygen consumption the myocardial oxygen consumption to reduce the systolic pressure so that the heart beats a bit better so first point always in an indication is failure to come of bypass okay the second one is in severe ischemic mitral regurgitation again in ischemic mitral regurgitation it's a failing heart okay and we'll talk about this when uh, vikas does the talk on uh, mitral regurgitation the third point is in a ventricular septal defect okay but in both of these ischemic mitral regurg and in a vsd it works best when you are in hemodynamic compromise and you are waiting for repair okay these are the sickest patients and so these are the ones where you want to put in a balloon before you take them to theater so that's the first one no choice but pump the second indication is probably harmless but probably not useful high risk cabg the, the the evidence for all of this is is starting to accumulate more and more okay so now forget the first line but just you can use this in the exam so in a high risk cabg as a pre operative measure you can use balloon pumps in a high risk pci as a pre operative measure to help the myocardium before the procedure you can use a balloon pump 
in a cardiogenic shock while waiting for P PCI and in pulmonary edema in spite of maximal medical management. You can use a balloon pump. Again, this is a failing heart that you're trying to help, okay? Uh, prophylactic use, you need any two of the following in CABG. One is a left main stenosis more than 70% or a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40%, unstable angina perioperatively, and sometimes in a redo CABG, okay? You might have to use IABP as a prophylactic measure to support the myocardium and get him through the procedure. Uh, the other indications, some of them are experimental, are tokotsubu cardiomyopathy, neurogenic cardiomyopathy of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and in severe aortic stenosis. Now, don't ask me details of these things. I have not read them. So this is uh, straight from the exam question and answer, but I don't know the details of tokotsubu cardiomyopathy. I really don't understand the phenomenon. But you, if you want, you can read it. So what are the contraindications for an IABP? One is an absolute contraindication. One is aortic regurgitation. Uh, obviously, because if in an aortic regurgitation, if you use IABP, you will make the regurgs from a moderate regurg to a severe regurg, okay? Because you are increasing the back pressure across the aortic valve. The second thing is in the presence of aortic aneurysm, always not a good idea to insert a device into, into an aneurysm. You might predispose a rupture of the aneurysm. Third situation is an aortic dissection. Uh, again, you don't know whether you're going to get into the true lumen or the false lumen of the aorta. So always a worry uh, to put in the balloon pumps into aortic dissection. In fact, you will never uh, manage to get into the correct plane. Uh, in the presence of severe sepsis, uh, you do not want to use a, a IABP because in the presence of severe sepsis, uh, you want to... Uh, Sorry, just let me clear all these drawings, whoever is drawing. Okay, so in the presence of severe sepsis, the last thing you want to put into uh, the patient's body is a foreign, foreign material. Uh, so that will actually make situation worse. Uh, and then, of course, last but not the least, uncontrolled coagulopathy. So if the patient is not controlled, uh, coagulopathy is not controlled, he can bleed to death from the, from the insertion process because it is an invasive procedure. You are, you are puncturing the femoral artery and you are putting in a catheter across into the femoral artery. So it is an invasive procedure. So coagulation and coagulopathy has to be controlled, okay? Now, relative contraindications for IABP are uh, uh, atherosclerosis and arterial tortuosity because you've got to get through the femoral artery. So, and if you've got atherosclerosis and difficult, uh, uh, difficult um, access, then you will not be able to uh, put in the uh, balloon pump. A uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is a relative contraindication. Uh, it does increase the uh, problems in, in the patients. Uh, contraindication to anticoagulation is also considered as a relative contraindication to IABP. The common complications of IABP are mild limb ischemia, a balloon leak, limb leak a major limb ischemia, hemorrhage, and leg amputation due to ischemia. So the main complication is ischemia. That's the main thing that you're worried about. Uh, <clears throat> the other rarer complications are atheromatous cholesterol emboli, aortic or arterial dissection, cerebrovascular accident, thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, because you're inflating and closing the balloon within the circulation. So you may actually cause hemolysis of the RBCs and cause the subsequent problems with the balloon pump or helium embolism. If the balloon ruptures and you continue to blow in <coughs> helium into the system, you might get actually helium uh, embolism. Uh, these few slides I put in for completion sake so that people uh, who are going for exam know the answers to the commonly asked question on IAB. So now my question to you is please draw me a normal aortic cycle on the basis of the cardiac cycle. Draw me three cycles, okay? So one, two, and three. And then in the middle cycle, I want you to show me the deployment of a intra-aortic balloon pump. How will it look? Show me the tracings. So show me an aortic notch with a systole, diastole. Don't forget the dichrotic notch. I want to see the dichrotic notch and then return back to normal. So the seven phases that we spoke about in a cardiac cycle. 
So the first graph that you draw will be a normal aortic tracing. The second one will be a augmentation. And the third one will be a normal aortic tracing because there are some important points of differentiation in each one of them. So please draw a normal IABP tracing. Are you guys done? Yeah. Okay. Have you marked the various parts? I want you to mark the various parts as well. So make sure that there is always an x-axis and a y-axis. And once you've finished the tracing, below that, on a second tracing, draw me the pressure of the balloon pump. Show me a tracing which shows that the balloon pump is in inflating and deflating. I want you to correlate that with your tracing of the IABP. And I'll show you in a minute the tracing. Done? I want you to show me the tracing of the balloon pump. What is happening to that balloon? How is it increasing and decreasing? Okay, so let me just continue. So this is the normal tracing, okay? So now look carefully at this. The first thing, this is important to understand this tracing, okay? So the first thing is the x-axis. X-axis is time, all right? And y-axis is pressure. So if you put x-axis and y-axis, I'm happy. You, you have to put time versus pressure. So this is your normal aortic, okay? Systole, diastole, dichrotic notch, systole, dichrotic notch, and then continuing into diastole. The diastole starts somewhere here, okay? Agreed? So this is systole, and then the di dichrotic notch, the closure of the aortic uh, valve, causes the dichrotic notch. So there's a pushback, a slight increase in the pressure. That is the start of diastole, and then it traces down, and then the pressure gradually comes down. Isovolumetric relaxation, okay? So same volume and isovolumetric relaxation. And then what you have to do, a normal aortic uh, balloon pump, what it does is look at the blue tracing. As soon as you come to the diachrotic notch, that means as soon as the balloon, as the aortic valve has closed, you inflate the balloon. So the balloon goes, book, the helium pushes into the balloon and you always overinflate it. It's always an overinflation. So it goes in and you get this overinflated spike and then you reduce it to get a plateau phase. And then the deflation happens just as you're reaching the assisted peak, okay? So here is the deflation and always the deflation is an over deflation before you reach the mean thing. So here is your balloon pump. Here is your aortic tracing. You're coming to the end of systole at the ejection, at the dichrotic notch, the balloon pump inflates and you get augmented of the pressure, augmentation of the pressure in diastole. This is important, okay? So this is diastolic augmentation. So that is the first benefit is that there is augmentation of pressure in the diastole. The augmentation of the pressure in the diastole and deflation of the balloon brings about reduction of the uh, end, when, end aortic pressure, end systolic aortic pressure. See this, can you say end diastolic aortic pressure? So this is the baseline, but what is happening is you are going below the baseline. So this is the assistance of end diastolic pressure. So the end diastolic pressure is going below the baseline. So both phases of the diastole, you get benefit. You get not just benefit in the diastolic augmentation where it improves the coronary circulation, improves the cerebral circulation, and beyond the balloon, it improves the circulation in the art, renal artery and the legs. But most importantly, it also reduces the uh, end diastolic pressure. So when the end diastolic pressure in the aorta reduces, the heart has to work less to achieve the same amount of 
uh, ejection fraction. Can you see that? So this benefit, this extra thing, the heart is having to work less. So this is an assisted systolic pressure. But look, now because you have gone down here, you don't have to work as hard to achieve the same amount of pressure increase, okay? So the amount of ejection pressure goes down, but the volume remains the same. Did you understand that? So this is the understanding of, of uh, balloon pump. That is why most people draw this and they stop. Okay, whenever in the exam I've asked people to draw balloon pump, most people draw this normal and they draw this augmentation and stop. And I'm sure today a lot of you did that. You just drew this augmentation for me and stopped. But that is not where the balloon pump stops. The balloon pump benefit continues into diastole and you have to draw the next cycle where there is reduction, severe reduction in the end diastolic pressure in the aorta, okay? So this pressure has gone down. This is the baseline in the previous cycle. Look, it's gone down. And then the next cycle also has to be drawn where you have to show that the myocardium has to work less to get the same amount of pressure. So this peak has to come down, okay? So the assisted systolic pressure in the peak following the balloon is always less. So myocardial oxygen consumption is less. And then you come back to base, okay? Did you understand that? So this is very, very, very important that you don't just draw one peak and show me one peak. That is not the point. The point is you have to continue and show me this benefit in end diastole. And more importantly, you have to show me the benefit in, end, in, syst in the next systole. Because in the next, next systole, you don't have to work as hard to get the same aortic pressure. Did this make sense, guys, or no? Anybody's got any questions to ask? I'm quite happy to stop. This is once in a lifetime chance to learn this very, very well. Okay? Yes or no? One person keep mic on and just tell me if you've understood or not. Understood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have you understood? Yes. That yes, it is understood. never one tracing. It is, you have to draw the second and the third tracing also. That is a normal balloon pump tracing, not just the one tracing. Or if you draw just one cycle with one little augmentation, that's not good enough because that's not telling me that you've understood the real benefit of a balloon pump. You got to continue on to the next tracing and show me that the systole has gone down. The work of myocardium on systole has gone down. That is why I explained it before I showed you the tracing. Yeah? Okay. Now, show me an ECG trigger on the balloon pump. Draw me the same. Just draw me the second part of, the, of that previous graph. This second part, just draw me. But on the top of this, draw me an ECG and show me what is the ECG trigger for the balloon pump. Because balloon pump works on ECG trigger. So yesterday I showed you an ECG, where is the depolarization of the myocardium happening? What is the start of diastole on the ECG? So now draw me just the middle part, but show me the ECG trigger for the balloon pump. Because balloon pump, the best, only way it senses when to inflate and when to deflate is on the basis of an ECG. Is it making sense? Yes, sir. Okay, draw me the trigger of the ECG. Whenever you are ready, I'm happy to go to the next one. So draw the dichrotic notch. Show me the ejection after the inflation of the balloon pump. But on top of it, I want you to show me what is happening on the ECG because the balloon is always triggered according to the ECG. Hey, somebody switch off your... Uh... Show me the ECG trigger for a balloon pump. Very important. PQRST and then the next PQRST, but what lies on that augmentation phase?
So what triggers the inflation and what triggers the deflation? on the basis of a cardiac cycle I want to know. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yeah, Vikas, happy? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the picture of the ECG trigger, okay? So always remember you on the ECG, you need to know what is diastole, okay? And so this T wave, the peak of T wave, the midpoint of the T wave is the one that the balloon is sensing. Okay, so the augmented augmentation, the diacrotic notch always is at the peak of, uh, at the middle of the T wave. So the balloon pump is sensing for T waves. And when you get a T wave, that's when the balloon blows the helium into the balloon and causes the augmentation. Then you have the next cycle and you've got the P, you got the Q, and then you got the R, the peak of R wave. It is always the peak of R wave which triggers the deflation, okay? You may not understand it straight away. Take your time, it's okay. Keep it with you and go back. But remember in an exam, when I ask you on an ECG, what is the trigger point for the balloon inflation? It is the midpoint of the T wave or the peak of T wave. And what is the trigger point for deflation? It is always the peak of R wave that triggers the deflation of the balloon pump. And whenever you physically adjust, because you have controls on the balloon pump, okay? Because if there's arrhythmia and things like that, then you can physically trigger the, uh, the arrangement and you can adjust your balloon pump in such a way. There, there are setting controls and you can adjust it. So you have to set it so that the balloon pump picks the, in the, the inflation of the balloon pump down here, the blue one, starts at the middle of the T wave and the deflation, which is happening here after the plateau, is correlated to the peak of R wave. That is a correct example of proper selection of balloon inflation and deflation. Is it making sense now? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is it. Uh, <clears throat> So this is the second, the benefit of balloon pump, the second benefit that this decrease in aortic pressure means that the left ventricle needs to generate less pressure to open the aortic valve. See, this diagram is self-explanatory. Thus, the afterload is reduced. That is the other answer. The afterload is reduced. As the balloon deflates, the aortic pressure decreases. Yeah, so this deflation is important. So that was the second understanding. Again, this is just an understanding of the pressure of the balloon tracing. So always when the balloon triggers, it's the middle of the T wave and it usually overinflates, overshoots and then plateaus down. The plateau is at maximum inflation. So if you read the pressures within the balloon, you will find that it suddenly jerks up, but then plateaus out. And this is the maximum amount of helium which is flowing into the balloon. And then the balloon deflates and whenever you look at it, it's the physics of the thing that whenever it deflates, there is always an overshoot of deflation and then it uh, levels out. The other thing you need to remember is that the baseline filling pressure is 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury in a balloon pump. So sometimes if you're asked to draw just the tracing of the balloon pump, this is the tracing of the balloon pump. Always remember over inflation, don't forget over deflation, but the latent period is important and the latent period can be maintained as a flat line, okay? So this is the understanding of inflation, deflation, and ECG triggered tracing of a balloon pump, okay? All right. Show me what's gonna happen in an early inflation of a balloon pump. What happens if your balloon is not triggered properly and it is causing early inflation of the balloon. Which means that the balloon is inflating in systole, late systole. Is that okay or is that a problem? That is counter.
just quickly draw me a diagram of what happens if the balloon is triggering early. So early inflation of balloon form. Are you guys drawing or not drawing? Thank you. What do you think will happen? And is it okay to have an early inflation of balloon form? Anybody can take this question. Anybody wants to take the question? In late systole, the balloon pump is inflated. What is going to happen? Work of the heart. How? Uh, sir, as it is, the heart is supposed to be pumping forward, and if the yeah. balloon inflates, it will push the back uh, blood back towards the heart. So the heart, the end system. What will happen to the aortic valve? So the, uh, Aortic valve will remain open. Early closure of aortic valve. Early closure of aortic valve. You're absolutely right. Early closure of aortic valve. Because aortic valve closure depends on the atrial pressure. Yeah? So there will be early closure of aortic valve. What will happen to the cardiac output? Cardiac output is going to reduce. Good. Excellent. Very good. So this is the answer to it. Okay? So if you move this aortic inflation deflation early in the aortic cycle somewhere here mid systole or late systole then the aortic valve is closed prematurely because the pressure in the aorta will suddenly go up when the pressure in the aorta goes up the back pressure will cause the aortic valve to close prematurely systole will end prematurely and the lv will be incompletely ejected so one is the cardiac output will go down, but in the next cycle, the heart is already full and more blood is coming on. So in a failing myocardium, you're increasing the workload of the, of, the, of the ventricle. So that is very, very bad. If you inflate a balloon pump early in a failing myocardium, very rapidly the patient will go downhill. Because here you are trying to increase cardiac output, but early inflation will decrease the cardiac output by causing early closure of the aortic valve and early end of systole. So the next systole will suffer. The subsequent systoles will suffer. So it is very, very important to time the aortic, uh, to time the balloon pump correctly so that the heart does not struggle, okay? So there is increased left ventricular oxygen demand because the afterload is increased, okay? There is decreased LV oxygen supply because the diastolic perfusion has gone down. So the coronaries have not perfused well and you have closed, you have inflated the balloon. Very, very bad situation. So one, you are increasing the LV oxygen demand and you're decreasing the oxygen supply by decreasing the amount of blood which will go into the coronary arteries. Thereby, in the next cycle, the cardiac output will go down because the stroke volume has gone down, okay? So this is a very, very, very bad thing to do. Never ever inflate a balloon pump early in a, uh, in a sick patient, okay? These are the three things that you have to remember. Oxygen demand goes up, oxygen supply goes down. Both of them are not good for a failing myocardium, which is already struggling. So the cardiac output will go down and the stroke volume will go down as well, okay? All right, now draw me a diagram of late balloon inflation and tell me what is going to happen to it when there is late balloon inflation. Is there a problem if you inflate it too late? Yeah, so this is the diagram. So what is the problem if you deflate it too late? Anybody wants to tell me? The coronary perfusion will suffer. We will not be able yeah. to augment the coronary perfusion. So the benefit of the balloon is lost if you deflate it, inflate it too late. The diastolic augmentation which you were expecting to get in a normal IBP, see the normal tracing. 
look up here. This is the normal tracing. But when you deflate it too, if you inflate it too late in the cycle, the diastolic augmentation is hardly anything. You've lost this diastolic augmentation. The moment you lose the diastolic augmentation, what is lost? Coronary perfusion is lost. The benefit of increasing coronary perfusion is lost. So this is the answer. Whenever balloon is inflated too late in the cycle, the diastolic augmentation is lost. And because diastolic augmentation is lost, coronary perfusion does not go up. You are here trying to increase the coronary perfusion. See this, this is a late inflation and see this, this is normal inflation. So this difference is not achieved. Can you see this? It's a huge difference. And this is the whole reason why you're using the balloon pump. And if you don't time it right, you are doing more damage to the patient, not less damage. So there is more damage to the patient and the myocardium, which is already struggling, will quickly give up and you will lose the benefit of a balloon pump, okay? So whenever a sick patient on a balloon pump starts to deteriorate, a sick patient on a balloon pump starts to deteriorate, the first thing you have to look at is the timing of the balloon pump. Is the balloon pump timing itself correctly on the patient or not? Because even if you inflate early, or you inflate late, both of them are detrimental to the benefit of the patient. So it is very important. The first thing when I somebody calls me and says, the patient's blood pressure is falling, the cardiac output and index is falling, in spite of having put in a balloon pump, the first thing I do is I go to the balloon pump and I study the trace and I study the ECG. I look at the ECG, I study the trace and I want to time the ECG not, uh, I want to time the inflation, not on the basis of the aortic tracing, but on the basis of ECG. So I'm always looking for the ECG when I'm timing the balloon pump. So you cannot time, you know, it's not easy to time it to the diacrotic notch, but it's easy to time it to the T wave, the peak of the T wave. So always you have to manipulate. The question that will ask you, as I said, is what do you do? You should say, I will go to the balloon pump and I will look at the timing of the balloon pump. There's something wrong with the timing of the balloon pump. And I want to make sure that it is not inflating too early. And I want to make sure it is not inflating too late. So it should not be after the diacrotic knot and should not be before the diacrotic knot. It should be at the diacrotic knot. Is it making sense? Everybody, is it making sense or is it getting yes, more sir. complicated? Yes, sir. Okay. yes, sir. The next question is, what is going to happen when there is early balloon, uh, sorry, this is late balloon inflation. So diastolic augmentation is lost and the coronary perfusion is lost, okay? So these are the two problems of late balloon inflation. Yeah? Now tell me what, draw me a, oh God, I forgot to do this. Okay, so this is a diagram for early balloon deflation. So now explain to me what will happen in an early balloon deflation. What is it? I, I forgot to animate this slide. I'm sorry about that. So if you deflate it before the peak of R wave, what is the problem? Can somebody tell me? The advantage of falling uh, arctic pressure, which we were getting, will not get. Absolutely. The end diastolic pressure returns to its unassisted level. So if you deflate the balloon, balloon early, then this end diastolic pressure decrease of the aortic pressure is not achieved. You see in the previous one, the end diastolic pressure was here, but here it is back to the same level as the previous one. Can you see that? So the assisted heart really receives no assistance at all. You are managing to push more blood into the coronaries, no doubt about it. So you, you're, when you inflate it, you're definitely pushing more blood into the coronary circulation. You're definitely putting more blood into the cerebral circulation. But the advantage of the aortic end diastolic pressure, the increase myocardial oxygenation and the decrease in the end diastolic pressure is not achieved. So the heart is receiving no benefit whatsoever. So the deflation is also not a good thing. If you deflate too early, then that's not good for the patient, okay? 
So early deflation fails to improve the left ventricular afterload and thereby fails to decrease the left ventricular oxygen demand. The left ventricle is not assisted in opening the aortic valve because obviously the aortic pressure has gone up, not down. We wanted the aortic pressure to go down in the next systole, but it has not gone down. So the poor left ventricle is again having to work hard on isovolumetric contraction to open the aortic valve because the pressure on the other side is higher. So there is no afterload reduction when the balloon deflates early. Did you understand that? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, now draw me a diagram of late balloon deflation. So there are four diagrams, early inflation, late inflation. The next diagram is early deflation and late deflation. Show me what happens in a late deflation. Is there any problem or there is no problem? <clears throat> also draw the aortic IABP uh, tracing as well, below the aortic tracing. So don't forget to draw the IABP tracing. Done. Okay, so this is the diagram for a late balloon deflation. The problem with late balloon deflation is that you are now impinging into the next systole. Okay, you are not ending it before systole. So when you deflate a balloon too late, you are impinging into the next systole. When you impinge into the next, next systole, what you're doing is you're increasing the pressure in the aorta. The moment you increase the pressure in the aorta, the poor myocardium has to work very hard to overcome the increased pressure in the... So the myocardium is contracting, but the, the balloon has not yet deflated, and the pressure is so high in the aorta that it is really having to work hard to push open that aortic valve. So again, a failing myocardium, if you deflate the balloon too late, you're going to make the myocardium work harder. So your end, aortic end diastolic pressure will go up. See this. So this tracing, which is supposed to be down here, because you're supposed to do an end diastolic decrease in the pressure, now has unfortunately gone up here. See, this is the baseline tracing. And so this baseline tracing, this tracing has gone up. It is actually harder for the next systole. So if you deflate it too much, too late, then your end diastolic pressure is gone up and unfortunately you're impinged into the next systole and that's not good. And continue that over a few cycles and the myocardium will suddenly give up and say, I can't work against this balloon. So you are doing more damage to the patient when you're doing a late deflation. So the late deflation could be because of a kink in the catheter, but the problem is it increases end diastolic pressure and it increases the afterload as a result of which the left ventricular oxygen consumption increases. Did this make sense? This is the basic understanding of a balloon pump and the tracings of a balloon pump. Did you, did you understand balloon pump or not? Yes or no guys, or any confusion? Hello? No answer. Yes, yes, understood. We are writing it down. That's why it's taking time. You don't need to worry about writing it down. Yes, this yes. is all being recorded. Yes, so yes. this will all go out there. Okay, all right. So now I'm going to quickly talk a few slides on ventricular assist devices. 
This is not a lecture on ventricular assist device. Please, I'm not going to show you any diagrams or anything like that. I just want to show you a comparison of balloon pump versus VADs. Okay, so let's quickly few things about uh, the indication contraindications and then just the uh, LVAD versus balloon pump, the indication and contraindication. So when so I'm just going to go through these slides. There are no questions here. Okay, so the ventricular assist device is indicated in cardiogenic shock. In cardiac arrest, in fulminant myocarditis, in and in failure to wean on bypass. Okay, it can be standby for high risk PTCA and can be on standby for high risk cardiac surgery with poor preoperative function. The contraindications to a ventricular assist device are the same like a balloon pump. So aortic regurgitation, aortic aneurysm or dissection, a thrombus in the left heart, uncontrolled bleeding or uncontrolled sepsis. So more or less the same. The ventricular assist devices are either available as an axial uh, pump, which is an Archimedes screw, or a centrifugal pump. The flow is non-pulsatile, which results in poor end organ function. The action of a pumping blood in this way provokes hemolysis. The insertion usually requires a sternotomy, and it may be implanted for up to a month, but you can't walk around with it. In the, uh, But the newer models you can actually, they are portable, and they are, uh, th there are some newer models which are available. But again, this is not a talk on VADs, so please don't uh, expect me to go into the details. Heparin is the choice of drug, and APTT is monitored to keep it under control. Uh, these are the complications of a <clears throat> ventricular assist device, infection, arrhythmias, thrombi, hemolysis, and thrombocytopenia. These are all self-explanatory. For me, this is the important thing. That's why I bought these few slides in, is look at this, okay? this. Picture, please take a shot of this. And this is the, the comparison of balloon pump versus uh, LV devices. So there are indications, uh, the logistics, the anticoagulation needed, and the complications. This is by far the best graph I've found, which actually gives you a direct comparison of A versus B. So take this slide and keep it with you and go through it uh, later on and, and, and try to understand it, OK? So this is all very, very nicely put out. The same things that I told on the slide are now completely in front of you, where IABP and VAD are compared with indications. Uh, these are the contraindications of IABP versus VAD, uh, ventricular assist devices. Uh, these are the advantages of IABP, very, very clearly laid out, bedside and things like that. So just go through this slide. I'll, I'll leave it up there for you. On our, uh, on our, this is all the written part, which I showed on my slides is directly from these uh, written, uh, from these graphs. And these are the disadvantages of IABP versus balloon uh, pump. And then the anticoagulation that is required and the complications that you get IABP versus VAD. So this is actually a summary of all my previous slides in a chart form, okay? So I've put it up as a chart for you to understand all the things. Uh, and, and very often in the exam, we ask you, what is the benefit? What is the complication? What is the difference between a LVAD or a RVAD versus IABP? Okay. One last graph I'm going to do. It is six o'clock exactly. So anybody, actually Vikas, you take over this, um, this, and I want you to actually explain. I want everybody to draw this, okay? So draw me. Uh, the heart sounds in first draw the normal heart sound in relation to diastole, systole, diastole, systole, and then draw me aortic stenosis, draw me mitral regurgitation, draw me aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. And if you want, you can also draw PDA. Because do you want to take over this uh, slide? I don't mind you taking over this slide. Okay, I'll, I'll put up the pictures and you can take over the slide. Because you just did the talk on aortic and mitral stenosis. So it'd be perfect for you to explain this next uh, picture which I put up. But first, everybody draw because this is something that is asked in the exam. So draw a vertical line and draw diastole, then draw another vertical line, and draw systole. Then draw another diastole and systole and give me the sounds. Where is the first and the second heart sound? I want to know the first and the second heart sound. This is my last slide for, for this talk and then we'll go back to ECT.
and vikas you can take over the explanation of this this because you did such a yes, sir. beautiful job when you explained this whenever you have drawn it please tell me you have drawn it so i want to know normal then second one i want to know is aortic stenosis the third one is mitral regurgitation the fourth one is aortic regurgitation and the fifth one is mitral stenosis and if you want you can also draw pda but these are the common ones that are asked in the exam Yes or no? Hello? Okay, there is the answer. Vikas, take over and explain all of them for them. Okay. So first, first A is the uh, normal heart sound. So first heart sound is uh, due to closure of the uh, the heart and the mitral and tricuspid valves. So this is a high pitch sound. And then second heart sound is due to closure of the pulmonary and the aortic valves. So in aortic stenosis, uh, we have a diamond shaped uh, high pitch. This is one of the highest pitch murmurs which we find in a uh, in in cardiac with uh, cardiac pathology. So this is a diamond shaped murmur. It, it is typically called called a crescendo crescendo decrescendo murmur so so second second diagram is the uh, uh, murmur of the aortic stenosis uh, in mitral regurgitation we have a pan systolic pan systolic murmur so uh, this murmur is a low pitched murmur and it is best heard at the apex so in mitral uh, mitral uh, regurgitation the first heart sound is uh, uh, actually bo both the heart sounds are basically um uh, overshadowed by the murmur so that's why we are not seeing that first heart sound and second sound uh, sound that i think the first heart sound is uh, uh, submerged in the murmur then aortic regurgitation uh, the first heart sound uh, first heart sound will be not, uh, not normal and we will have a decrescendo diastolic murmur uh, so this murmur is uh, highest in intensity highest in intensity at intensity at the starting and it decreases as the diastolic progresses so we have to that that is shown that the volume of murmur is higher in the initial stage the mitral stenosis is a typical murmur which is a uh, late diastolic murmur and there are two three things in mitral stenosis murmur which we have seen so here uh, unless the uh, uh, mitral valve is very calcified the first heart sound will be uh, first heart sound will be louder so that first heart sound we have to draw louder and then uh, the murmur is late diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation in the heart heart sounds we have and there's the opening snap this opening snap is because of the billowing of the uh, leaflets of the mitral valve and uh, why we have a pre systolic accentuation because if the patient is not in atrial fibrillation the third third uh, there are three phases in the diastole the rapid ventricular filling phase then uh, phase of diastasis and then proto diastole so in the proto diastole that is the time when the left atrium is contracting and it is ejecting extra blood into the uh, ventricle so that is the time we have pre systolic accentuation so this pre systolic accentuation will not be there if the patient is having uh, regurgitation uh, if the patient is having either mitral regurgitation or atrial fibrillation then go, go slow go slow because go okay. slow you're doing really yes, well sir. just go slow because okay. people are trying to understand they're looking at the picture and trying to understand what you're saying so so, so in mitral stenosis oh, yeah. in mitral stenosis uh, unless there uh, the leaflets of the valve is calcified we will have the loud first heart sound and the murmur is late diastolic murmur so uh, and there is opening snap this opening snap is because of billowing of the mitral valve leaflets when the leaflets are opening that time because of uh, stenosis there's a uh, effect like when we pull the springs of the kite it gets taut so when the leaflet the cordae are getting taut that time we get the opening snap then there is pre systolic accentuation because there are three phases of diastole the rapid ventricular filling phase then diastasis and proto diastole in proto diastole that is the time when left atrium is contracting and filling the left ventricle
so that time we some extra blood is getting pushed that is 30, almost 15 to 30 percent of the uh, cardiac output uh, so that is why we have uh, pre 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 systolic accentuation and last one is patent ductus arteriosus this is in a machinery murmur because the uh, the pressure in aorta is high and pressure in the pulmonary artery is very low so it the flow is both in the uh, diastole and systole so that is why both the heart sounds we can see they are bur uh, buried in the machinery murmur. So this is also one of the loudest murmur, and most of the time it will be associated with this. Excellent, excellent. Did everybody understand? This is very, very self-explanatory, but uh, because he just did the topic and he showed these graphs in his talk, and I'm sure he's going to show these graphs in the in this week. He's going to do mitral uh, stenosis, so he's going to show us the same thing. It's very important. This picture you must, must, must practice again and again. Okay, once you understand this picture very clearly, then there is no question about uh, the long case. Absolutely no question about your long case. It's very easy once you've understood this picture. Most people struggle because they don't have this picture in their mind. So it's all very, very beautifully explained, you know, crescendo, decrescendo showing the timing of the murmur, where exactly it's happening. As long as you can tell me first and second heart sound, I'm very happy with that. That is all I want to hear. And I want to hear the description of the murmur. That's all I want, okay? And if you can time the murmur and show me the description of the murmur, you will, you will pass your exams. Then after that, the discussion is on to other things, management and all is, is for extra marks. But for passing, you need to be able to identify the murmur and describe the murmur to me. Because once you identify the murmur correctly, then your diagnosis in the long case will become very, very clear, okay? And then the management does not fail you. You never ever fail on a management. You will usually fail because you forgot, you did not identify the murmur correctly, okay? So very important. Up to the point of the murmur, the moment you have said the murmur is correct, we know you're going to come up with the correct diagnosis. We have passed you in the exam. And then you go on to the next phase. Everything else is for extra marks. Okay? So now I'm going to stop here. I won't do the graphs in pulmonology now. Uh, I want to actually stop sharing this for a minute. Uh, because give me back the control. Let me take back the control. Uh, and um, I'm going to stop this recording first. Okay. So did this make sense, guys? Was it all right? Or uh, was it too much for you guys? Quickly give me feedback before we finish this. I always keep asking for feedback because I don't know what is happening. This is an online lecture, so I don't know whether you guys are understanding or not understanding. No, no, IAPP was crystal clear, sir. Very clear. Crystal clear. Very no? clear. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Good, good, good. So now let us go back to the ECG and I will start sharing again ECG. Now, now I don't need to give you control because nobody else will enter. So is it okay? Shall we do ECG now or do you want to not do ECG? Yes, sir. A lot of people we'll... already there in logged in. Okay, so let's, let's do, do ECG. ECG. Yeah, let's do the ECG. So I'm going to restart with the rhythm, okay? Because yesterday I think I I went a little fast with the rhythm yesterday. So okay. So let's restart with the rhythm and go through. We've got the rhythm to do, we've got the conduction problems to do, and we've got the uh, MIs to do. Okay, these are the three things, abnormality of QRST. So let us go through this, let's go. We went, we spent about an hour and a half yesterday trying to explain to you the basics of the ECG. So once you come back, uh, one minute, let me start recording first. That's the other thing I forget. Uh, sorry, one second. Uh, record. Okay, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes or no, guys? Tell me quickly. No, sir. Uh, no, you sir. Can't see my I'm not no, sharing. Sir. No. Okay, share screen. Share screen. Blue one. Share. Can you see my blue screen now? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, and now can you see rhythm written? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So let's go back into the rhythm quickly. Now we'll move fast because we've done the ECG, we understand it. So whenever you say say a sinus rhythm of an ECG, there should be a P wave. The P wave should be round shape. 
it should always have the same shape. There should be no change in the shape. It should, each P wave has to be followed by a QRS. The PR interval has to be three to five small squares and constant, and the rhythm should be regular, okay? So that is the key thing for a sinus rhythm. Uh, we said yesterday, the P wave is coming towards the lead two. So P wave is always upright in lead two, and P wave is inverted in AVR, okay? So that is sinus rhythm. When you see P wave upright, then we know that. So this is a sinus rhythm, nice P, Q, R, S, and T. This is the rhythm strip. Everything is looking okay, no problem. This is a sinus rhythm. P followed by Q, R, S, T. Very, very clear cut. Yesterday we said there is, a, if there is a problem, it can be supraventricular or intraventricular. Supraventricular means the foci is somewhere else in the atrium, okay? So above the, above the ring of the ventricle, or the foci above the ring ventricle, causes supraventricular problems. The foci below causes ventricular problems, okay? So this is a rhythm chart. Whenever you see a, a, a whenever you see an ECG, you have to see the ECG in 12 leads, but more importantly, you've also got to see the rhythm strip. Okay, the rhythm strip is very important and you must always go in this order. You must always look for the rate. You must look for the rhythm, look for R to R uh, thing, which gives you the rate. Look for the P wave, look for P to QRS transmission, which is the PR interval, and then look for the QRS. So let's look at this ECG and try to understand it. So the rate is 150 beats per minute. The rhythm seems to be regular. The P waves are difficult. I can't see P waves here. Can you see that? I can't see P waves here. Very difficult. We've got the rate on the basis of the number of large boxes, okay? So two large boxes, so the rate is 150. Uh, P waves are difficult. QRS seems to be normal. So this is a, either a sinus tachycardia or is it, it is an SVT or it's an atrial fibrillation. So it is not fibrillation because we know that the rhythm is normal. In a fibrillation, the rhythm may not be, is not normal. So we know that this is either a sinus tachycardia or an SVT. In that situation, what you have to do is you have to stimulate the vagus or the carotids. When you stimulate the carotids and the heart rate goes down, you know you're dealing with an SVT. Uh, if it's a sinus tachycardia, then you have to give fluids to challenge the patient and bring down the sinus tachycardia. In addition to that, if the vagal stimulation is not working, then you give adenosine. If you give adenosine, then the heart rate comes down on the ECG. You know you are dealing with an SVT. So this was the analysis which I showed you yesterday. Uh, again, this is yesterday's slide, so I'm just uh, going a little bit faster. So here is another ECG. We have to calculate the uh, rate. Rate is 66 beats per minute. Number of R waves in a 10 second uh, rhythm strip. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So 11 into six is how you do it. So 11 into six, so rate will be 66 beats per minute. Then you look at the irregularity. See, QRS is okay. QRS is coming quite okay, but look at the P waves. There's, really this sort of fibrillatory movement in this P wave. Something is not right in the fibrillatory. See here, again, fibrillatory movements in the, in the P wave. So we know that this is a supraventricular problem. We know this is coming from the atria and it's more likely to be an atrial fibrillation because the P waves are not clearly seen. And more importantly, we are seeing fibrillatory waves. These waves are called as fibrillatory waves and that is atrial fibrillation. Okay. All right. So we have spoken about this yesterday. I won't waste time on that. So let's so look at this ECG. Have, have a look at this ECG. No P waves, really can't see the P waves very well. Uh, maybe there, maybe not there. Yeah, yeah. Here there is no P wave. The baseline is going up and down. That is the important thing. The baseline is changing. Um, the, the QRS is changing the rate. So here it is okay, here it is slow. So there is a real change of the QRS rate from one end to the other end. So there is definitely some problem happening here. The QRS shape is not okay. The T wave appears to be normal. In all of this, look at the T waves are normal. There is no problem with the T waves. Uh, so this is probably an atrial fibrillation because the P wave is fibrillatory, is absent, and it's causing the rhythm to go up and down. Okay, let's look at this one. This is a very, very good one. This is quite classic. Uh, the rate, again, you calculate exactly the same way. So the rate uh, works out to 150 because there are two R, large Rs between two QRSs. So that's about 150, 300 by two. The rhythm is regular, okay? So it's 
there is no irregularity of the rhythm two waves two boxes two boxes two boxes two boxes so regular rhythm but p wave is not very clear there's something that's, the p wave is not very clear okay it's it's really a problem here q r s t but what is happening here the p wave is not very clear but more importantly it is sort of sawtooth can you see this sharp sawtooth thing so this sawtooth thing is called as a f wave okay and the f wave is usually represented of atel flutter it will become clear in the next slide look at this this sawtooth this sharp sawtooth this is a f wave and this f wave is called as atel flutter classic seen in lead 2 avr and v1 okay classic it is always called as f wave and whenever you see this sharp up spike then think of the saw the teeth of the saw and uh, again the ratio can be 1 is to 1 2 is to 1 3 is to 1 so you can have one p wave followed by one qrs or you can have two p waves followed by one qrs or you can have three p waves followed by one qrs it so p the atrial rhythm is different and the ventricular rhythm is different so in this if you want to calculate the ventricular rhythm you have to calculate 1 2 3 4 four boxes so the ventricular rhythm is 300 divided by 4 which is 75 but atrial rhythm is is really fast so you have to calculate the number of p waves between on a on a 6 second rhythm strip or a 10 second rhythm strip and then you multiply it if it's a 6 second rhythm strip you multiply the number of p waves by 10 and if it's a uh, by 6 uh, if it's a 10 second you multiply by Six. If it is a six second, you multiply by ten. Okay. So once you have done that, so you get the P rate is different and the ventricular rate is different, and that gives you an idea of the block. So the ratio of the block depends upon atrial rate, the number of atrial beats versus the number of ventricular beats. That is what gives you the block because atria is contracting, contracting, contracting. but all the atrial contractions are not going to the ventricle so that is called as a block okay so again i'm going a little fast because we did this yesterday all right come on what's happened the most common in atrial flutter is a 2 is to 1 block all right so most important the most common is a 2 is to 1 block and this is classical atrial flutter again this is a classical atrial flutter okay all right again another one classical atrial flutter sharp peak with uh, separate qrs separate uh, uh, so the p wave rate is separate the qrs rate is separate and if you calculate the qrs versus the p rate it will be uh, turn out to be a 2 is to 1 block and this is a classical atrial flutter okay all right Uh, here there is one qrs there's one qrs but there's nothing there's there's a huge gap here okay the sa is fails to depolarize and there is a delay an abnormal p wave is seen okay abnormal p wave is seen okay so something is not right abnormal p wave but it is followed by a normal qrs so this space this fellow is creating its own p wave normal sa created a p wave so you got this qrs peak but this fellow created another p wave and that is an abnormal p wave which is not followed very well by a qrs so this again returns back to sinus can you see that so this is returning back to sinus this is called as atrial escape so whenever a separate foci of p wave creates an unusual p wave that is called as atrial escape okay again this is ventricular escape here you've got normal qrs normal Q, normal uh, pqrs and suddenly one qrs is coming into the picture this is not a normal qrs okay so because this is not a normal qrs it means that something is happening within the ventricle which is stimulating an abnormal qrs within your ecg rhythm and because of this after three normal sinuses there is an abnormal qrs this is called as a ventricular escape so when you get an extra ventricular beat 
not preceded by a P wave, that is called as a ventricular escape. When you get an abnormal P, not followed by a QRS, that's called as a atrial escape. So atrial escape and ventricular escape, that's what you have to see. Now let's look at this one, okay? So this is PQRS, T, PQRS, T, but look at what's happening here. Suddenly we've got a lot of QRS complexes coming. There is no time for T to be seen. There is no time for the repolarization to happen. So after two siren speeds, the heart rate has increased to 200. The QRS has become broad, okay? There's a broad QRS. And most importantly, the T wave is difficult to find. We are struggling to find the T wave in this one. And then again, it is returning to normal, okay? So what is happening in this? This is called as ventricular tachycardia, okay? So this is ventricular tachycardia, not atrial. This is a ventricular tachycardia because it's the QRS which has got affected. And because the QRS is higher potential than an atrial, even though the atrium is still contracting in this, you're not seeing any P waves in this because the ventricle is taken over. The electrical activity of the ventricle is much higher on the ECG strip. And so it is completely taken over. You cannot see any P waves in this. And most importantly, you cannot see any T waves because there's not enough time for the repolarization to show itself on the ECG strip. Okay, so this is ventricular tachycardia. Okay, so this is a 12 lead ECG. Let's have a quick look analysis of this ECG. So there is no P wave in this. The QRS are regular. And if you calculate the rate, the rate will come out to 200 beats per minute. The, dur the, the ECG is broad, okay? Broad QRS, the QRS is broad. The duration, if you calculate, it's almost 280 milliseconds. It's quite a large thing. The shape is also abnormal. This is not how QRS is supposed to be. There is no identifiable T wave, okay? There is no identifiable T wave, but it is still in, in, in a sort of a rhythm. There is no sort of, it's not a haphazard rhythm. So this is called again as ventricular tachycardia. So this is how a 12 lead ECG of a ventricular tachycardia will look like. Okay. Now this is different from the previous one. Okay. This is the previous one. This is different from the previous one. In this, the rhythm has gone chaotic. The ventricle is doing what it's supposed to, is, is not doing what it's supposed to do. And intermittently it's going all over the place. Look at that. It's all over. The baseline is also not maintained. The rhythm is not normal. There is a chaotic rhythm. The rate is also chaotic, sometimes, sometimes 200, sometimes 75. The P wave cannot be seen because the ventricular activity has taken over the whole ECG. The PR interval, you just there is no PR interval. You cannot see it at all in this. The QRS is chaotic. In some places it is absent, in some places it is completely chaotic. And this is a classical picture of what we describe as ventricular fibrillation. This is ventricular fibrillation. In ventricular fibrillation, the patient is going to arrest or is already arrested, okay? So you really need to act fast and defibrillate this patient. So very important. This is ventricular fibrillation. The previous slide was ventricular tachycardia. So there's a difference between ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia, if not treated, will quickly go into ventricular fibrillation and the patient will arrest, okay? So it's very important to differentiate the two, all right? Look at this, this is, the reason why ventricular fibrillation happens is multiple sources, all these stars start to fire and all of it becomes very chaotic and the patient will arrest very, very soon. Let's look at the CCG. Is it making sense or am I going too fast? It's making sense, sir, it is good, sir. Yeah, because we did this yesterday, so I'm not wasting too much time on it. So calculate the rate on the basis of RR interval. Uh, there is a right axis deviation. I showed you yesterday how to calculate the right axis deviation. Uh, the PR interval is quite short, okay? Look here, the PR interval is almost, you can't even make out here the PR interval. This is a very classic ECG, okay? Because what you see here, look at this. This is the key thing. This thing going upwards, this this curve of this ECG going upwards is called as a delta wave, okay? This slurred uptake 
This is called a delta wave. And you can see this in three. You can see this even here in V4. You can see this in V3. This upward slant is very classical. This uh, ECG is kept in the exam, okay? And this usually suggests a WPW, okay? Wolf, Park, uh, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So this presence of, um, presence of a delta wave, okay? And right axis deviation is usually indicative of WPW, okay? So this is what happens in a WPW. There is, there, there is a extra focus of, uh, of uh, stimulation, which causes what is called as a re-entry tachycardia. So you can't really see the penis. Again, see in this one, slurred uptake. Yeah, slurred uptake. So that's a delta wave, yeah? So this is, again, WPW. Another example of the slurred uptake. This, this curve is very important. See this curve? There is the PR interval is grossly shortened. There is no PR interval. And there is this curved uptake of the ECG. This is called as delta wave. So very important. Again, here you might appreciate a little bit here. Okay, all right. Uh, so this is how you do the whole analysis, okay? Whenever you sit with an ECG, you have to do this whole analysis like this. You have to go through everything and try to understand all the problems that are happening. Go through the rate, go through the rhythm, go through the RR interval, whatever is happening. And then you come to an answer of what is happening, okay? So I just showed this for you. This is WPW. I spoke about this yesterday. Uh, what is this? Okay, sorry, let me just come here. Yeah. Okay, so again, in this ECG, look what is happening here. What is this? Uh, the P is there, but something is spiking. Can you see that? This spikes, these regular spikes, these are pacemaker spikes. So occasional P waves, not related to QR, but there is a QR is preceded by a brief spike. The spike is always indicative of pacemaker. Okay, so the pacemaker stimulus is seen, and this is actually a pacemaker uh, spike. Okay. Uh, something's happening to my... And this is a pacemaker stimulus. All right. Uh, so whenever you're dealing with rhythm issues, always treat underlying cause. Extra systoles do not read treatment, but whenever you are in acute heart failure or uh, severe hypotension, always think of DC cardioversion. If you go into bradycardia, then think of atropin and pacing, okay? Uh, so that's important. Uh, I spoke about the carotid sinus massage the other day, and I spoke about uh, the management uh, of with adenosine. Okay, it's important to differentiate between the two. So this is the chart. Uh, please take a snapshot of this chart and try to understand it. And this chart actually gives you the idea of how to diagnose rhythm problems, okay? So this is a very, very good chart, but you have to look at P wave present or absent. You have to look at the PQRS, the PR ratio, whether it's normal, it is extended, or is it uh, QRS is absent? And the whole thing, if you follow this chart, you can make, any diagnosis on the rhythm problems of an ECG, okay? So that, that's what where we had stopped last time. Now let's look at conduction defects, okay? So conduction defects are very easy to understand, okay? Conduction defects, there are only four or five problems that you have to know in an ECG, which comes in the exam. The first one is a first degree hard block. The second one is a second degree hard block. And second degree hard block are two types, Mobitz type one, and Mobitz type two. And then you've got the third one, which is a complete hard block. And then in addition to that, we've also spoken about right bundle branch block and left bundle branch block. You remember the diagram of the, of the AV node and the, and the bundle of face and the right bundle and the left bundle, okay? So these are the various types of ECGs that you will look at. Now I will take you through each one of these and show you what is happening. So what do you think will happen in a first degree hard block? In a first degree hard block, there is one PR per QRS, okay? So the P is there, the QRS is there, the T is there. Completely, regularly, if you look, there is a P, there is a QRS, there is a T. All along here, there's a P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T. But what is happening is the PR interval, this is becoming prolonged, okay? And the last time when I did the lecture on ECG, I did tell you that a PR interval always denotes the AV bundle, okay? The PR interval denotes 
that there is no conduction in an AV bundle. Okay, remember the upward spike and downward spike are a flat line, and I said that that a PR interval denotes slow conduction in an AV bundle. So when you have a prolonged PR, look, the PR is prolonged. This is much much longer, three sixty milliseconds. Yeah. So this is a prolonged PR. So whenever you have a prolonged PR, it's called as first degree arc block. It's as simple as that. Not difficult at all. Calculate the PR interval, and you know uh, if a PR is prolonged, it is a first degree arc. Okay. So one P wave per QRS and PR interval greater than two hundred is always called as first degree arc block. Is it okay? It's very very simple. It it might be seen in normal people as well, but if it does happen, you have to think about MI, you have to think about rheumatic fever, but you really don't need to treat it. There is no problem with that. Okay, you don't need to treat it. So let's look at this one. This is a nice ECG. Where let's go through one first. Okay, so this is P, P R, Q R S T. Okay. But here, if you calculate the number of small squares and you multiply it by the formula, you get 260 milliseconds. Now, the next one, if you calculate the number of small square squares and you multiply it, because one small square is not 0.12 seconds. So again, this is 280 milliseconds. Look at this one. This is increased. There's 320 milliseconds. And then the fourth one is for not followed by a QRS. Yeah. So there is progressive increasing. PR levels in the CCG, and then a drop of the QRS. So whenever you have a progressive lengthening of a PR interval and one non-conducted P wave, and if you look again, the same cycle is starting. So next conducted B has shorter PR than the preceding. So this was 320. Look at that. here the beat has come back to 260. So again, the next conducting beat has a shorter PR than the preceding beat. This is quite classic of second degree hard block Mobitz type one. Okay, so the P wave may show itself as a distortion of the T. That's what they're saying that sometimes the P wave and the T wave come together, so there could be distortion of the T. But this a prolonging PR interval. On an ECG and drop of one QRS after a period of prolongation, and then the next PR is less than the preceding one, is called as Mobitz type one. Okay, so it's called Venkiback or Mobitz type one, which is progressive PR length, then a non-conducted P wave, and then repetition of the cycle. Is it making sense? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is it is it okay? Do you want me to go at this pace or fine? It's okay, sir. It's okay, sir. Okay. So now let's look at this one. The PR interval. Where is the PR? This is the PR. The PR interval of the beat is constant, but one P wave is not followed by a Q or QRS complex. Yeah. in the previous one the p wave was increasing yeah but in this one p wave has dropped okay so this is also a type of second second degree hard block but it is called as mobitz type 2 okay so there is occasionally there's a non conducted beat okay and the block could be 2 is to 1 or 3 is to 1 so depending on two prs followed by a non qrs or three so it's called as 2 is to 1 or 3 is to 1 so there may be two or three wave p waves per qrs complex but with a normal p wave rate okay so that's called as mobitz type 2 mobitz type 2 whenever you get a second degree heart block usually indicates heart disease there's some problem first degree may be normal in some physiological in some people physiologically you may actually get first degree heart block but whenever there's a second degree heart block think of mi okay there's something happening which is affecting the uh, av conduction into the bundle of his okay so it is the conduction of av to the bundle of his and usually mi okay they may not need specific treatment for rhythm but you have to treat the underlying cause but if the degree of heart block increases 
So from 2.1, it is 2 is to 1, it's going to 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1. Sometimes you might actually need to give them temporary pacemaker. So you might have to float a pacemaker wire, or you might even have to put in a ventricular pace, uh, uh, a permanent pacing box if the ventricular rate is very slow and not enough to create enough blood pressure. So this is, this is the indication of this, okay? All right. Now let's look at the next ECG, okay? There are two P waves per QRS complex. Can you see that? One and two, yeah? Two P waves and one QRS. Again, one P and two P. This is getting merged with the T, but definitely there's a bump, a separate. So two P waves with one QRS complex. Two P waves with one QRS complex, okay? Normal and constant PR interval in a conducted beat, okay? So this is a second degree heart block. It's very simple, it's second degree heart block. So one P wave is not conducting, and then one P wave is conducting. So this is a second degree heart block, but the important thing is two is to one. This is how you say two is to one. Let's look at another one. There is the P wave within the T. Yeah, you can see this P wave, you can see this P wave. Uh, again, the ident this is, th sometimes the P wave gets fused with the T, but this notch, is not normal in a T wave. So this is actually a P wave. So this is two P waves in one QRS, but the P wave is getting hidden by the T wave. You can see that very clearly. This is also second degree hard block, two is to one, okay? All right, let's look at the next one, okay? Look at this ECG. The P wave is at 90 per minute. So you calculate the number of P waves and you multiply it. The P wave and the QRS has no relation. See, there's nothing in between here. So here suddenly there is a large PR. Can you see this? Here there is a normal PR. Here there is a large, I don't know what the hell, the PR has gone really. So there is no correlation between the P and the QRS in the rhythm strip. The P is not followed by QRS. Here there is a normal P followed by a QRS. Here there is a normal P, but a long PR interval. So whenever you have no relationship uh, between P and QRS and the ventricular rate is slower, much slower than the P, than the atrial rate, then you have to worry about it, okay? Um, the QRS is also slightly abnormally shaped. Then you are dealing with a third degree heart block. A third degree heart block is because there's abnormal uh, depolarization because of a ventricular focus. So there is no, there's a lo complete loss of correlation between P and QRS. Can you see this? Here the P is followed by QRS, but here suddenly the QRS has come on its own. So there is no conduction happening across the AV to the, bun to the uh, bundle branches. It is, there is some problem in the bundle of A's. And this is a third degree hard block. Third degree hard block is not good, okay? You, you really always, a third degree hard block will need pacing. And unusually wide QRS complex. The QRS rate is very low. So the ventricular rate is much lower than the atrial rate. And it'll be very narrow, usually less than 50 to 60 beats per minute. And that is a third degree hard block. This indicates that the conducting tissue is diseased. Usually indicates fibrosis rather than ischemia. Ischemia usually causes first degree or second degree heart block. But when there is disease in the, in the fibers within the uh, bundle of haze, that is, uh, that is not good. And that usually will need a permanent pacemaker. Okay? So is third degree heart block okay? Understood? Yes, not? sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it's not difficult as long as your concept of PQRS is clear, it's not difficult. Okay, let's look at the next one, okay? So look at this one. I will just analyze it for you. So P, P wave is there, okay? P wave is there, but nothing is happening. What the hell is in, nothing. Only P waves are coming, yeah? The P wave rate, if you calculate the rate and you do on a six second step, it is 145 per minute. But the QRS is not coming, and when it is coming, it's very abnormal. Can you see that? Exceedingly abnormal. This is not the normal way QRS is supposed to look. And if you look at the rate, if you calculate the rate, it's 15 per minute. The QRS rate is 15 per minute. 
and there is no relationship between the P wave and the QRS. And this is indicative of third degree heart block. Okay. So very important to understand this. Third degree heart block always needs a permanent pacemaker. Okay. So this is exactly what happens. Uh, look at this again. This is the whole analysis is given at the bottom. This is a uh, complete heart block, two is to one. Okay. All right. Now let's look at the bundle branches. So this is the diagram which I should have had before. So AV, bundle of his, left, left bundle branch, right bundle branch. Okay. So what will happen if a, there is a right bundle? So see, this is cut off. This is, when this is cut off, this is called as a right bundle branch block, okay? So now this is a very classic pattern, very classic. If this comes in the exam, you're happy because you can diagnose this straight away. I'll show you what's happening, okay? So in a right bundle branch block, you get what is called as an RSR in lead one, okay? In lead V1, RSR one in lead one, okay? Just remember this for a minute. I'll explain to you how the RSR comes. And in a left bundle branch, you get a letter M in lead V6. So V1, you know, is in the second intercostal space. Yeah, sorry, is in the fourth intercostal space to the right of the sternum, okay? And we know V1 and V2 is looking at septum. I, I explained that yesterday. The V1 and V2 lead is looking at septal depolarization, okay? So what will happen if there is a problem with the right, see the right bundle is cut off here. There is, there's a block of the right bundle. So when the action potential reaches the AV node, comes down the bundle of his, it goes down preferentially down the left bundle. So we know that the left actually uh, depolarizes the septum from the left to right, yeah? So when it depolarizes from left to right, if you're looking at this from V1, this is V1 we know is a positive lead, it's a unipolar positive lead. So when this action potential is coming towards the positive lead, there will be an upward spike. So that is the first part of the R, okay? Now, what will happen is, then this, this action potential will go down the ventricle, okay? And preferentially will go down the left ventricle because more mass. The right one is blocked it's preferentially going down the left ventricle. So there is this downward spike, yeah? Downward spike. And then the right ventricle still has to depolarize. So after this is depolarized, it will come back to the right ventricle. So you got the R, you got the S because it went away from the lead V1. And most importantly, now the right ventricle is starting to depolarize. And so you get another R, okay? So there is R and R dash, okay? R and R1. So you get an R, S, R, 1. Did you understand this? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah? So let me do this again, okay? Right bundle branch, here is the right bundle. The right is blocked away. The septum is depolarizing. The movement is from left to right, so you get the first R. Now the, the thing is moving down the septum and going up on the left side, which is normal, which it's supposed to do, so that you get the S. But instead of getting your T now, ST interval, now the right ventricle will have to depolarize after, because this one is blocked off, so this gets depolarized, and then it comes back towards the right. So you get another R. So this RSR pattern in lead V1 is very, very classic of a right bundle branch block, okay? It's the best one to pick up, a right bundle branch block, okay? Now let's look at these things. Look at the ECG, okay? Have a look at the ECG, take your time and try to understand it. So this rate is normal. It's a sinus rhythm. The rate is 60 per minute. A PR interval is normal. There's no problem with the PR interval. PR interval may be okay. Look at this, PR interval is okay. Let's concentrate on V1. Uh, PR interval may be there. There's a P wave here. But look at the V1, okay? Look at this deflection. There's a small upward deflection, which is reflecting septal depolarization. Then there's a downward deflection, which is representing 
left ventricular depolarization because it's going away from ventricular one and then look at it it's coming back towards the right ventricle in a big way so septum ventricular and right ventricle coming back towards the right ventricle in a big big way okay so this is called as the rsr the axis is normal we calculated that the qrs is, is widened because it is taking more time for the ventricle to depolarize because if the right bundle branch is blocked off, then the action potential has to go down the left side, depolarize the left side, then come back and depolarize the right okay. side. So the QRS becomes widened. There is a widening of the QRS and you get this classical RSR1, okay, in V1. And, and if you look in V6, which is an opposite, there is a wide S wave, okay? So a wide S wave in V6, which is the opposite of what was happening in V1. Uh, is is representative of uh, is representative of right bundle branch block. Okay, now let's look at left. So this is sinus rhythm with right bundle. This is classical. If you get this in the exam, you're winning. Okay, so this V1 V2 is still representing the same thing. Look, V3 is also showing this. So this depends on where they have placed V1 V2, uh, and and how how well that ECG has been taken. So classically, it should be seen in V1, but it can be seen in V2 and V3 as well. If you bring the V2 and V3 closer to the right side, it will show you a right bundle branch block, okay? All right. Now let's look at left bundle branch block. See this diagram in the middle. So your AV node is depolarized, bundle of this is depolarized, but now the problem is there is no conduction going down the left bundle because it's disease. So the left bundle branch is gone. So the right bundle branch is depolarizing. Now it is going opposite. The septum is now depolarizing from right to left. Yeah, because the left is gone. So the septum is depolarizing from right to left. Because it is depolarizing from right to left, the, look at V6. We are now going because V6 looks at it from the left lateral. Yeah, V6 is here. So it always looks at the uh, ventricle from the left lateral side. So this is going towards V6. So you get this uh, spike. Then look at what's happening. It's coming here and going away, okay? It's starting to go away. So you get this little bit of S wave, which is starting to happen, but predominantly, it the right is done, but predominantly it's then pushing towards the left, okay? So the little bit of notch is because the right ventricle, the little bit of notch was because the right ventricle started to depolarize. The left, it didn't reach straight away, but then the surge will turn around and move towards the left ventricle. So you get this notch, you get the little bit of notch of right ventricular depolarization, but then the whole action potential turns around and aggressively depolarizes the left ventricle. So you get a very large notch which is an R. So this is an M pattern. Can you see that M pattern on a, on a V6? So if you get an M pattern on a V6, classically, it is left bundle branch block. Look here, V6, V5, V6, okay? Both of these are looking at it from the other side. So look at this. Can you see this? So your septum is depolarizing. Then your right ventricle is starting to depolarize. So this is going away. But then the action potential turned quickly and moved towards the left ventricle. So purely by looking at one bit of the QRS, you can actually understand what is happening on the heart, on the myocardium. So this is the septum depolarization. This is the right ventricle depolarization. This is the left ventricle depolarization. And so you're getting this complex of a M wave. So a sinus rhythm rate is 100. The PR is normal, that's not a problem. The axis is normal, you can calculate that. I showed you yesterday. But the QRS is again wide. It is wide because it's taking more time. It's going to the right, then coming to the left. So the, so the activity on the ventricle becomes wider. So it's a widened QRS because it's taking more time to reach the left ventricle. And there is an M wave on the QRS, okay? The M wave on the QRS, particularly seed in lead V5, V6, and also lead one, lead one comes from there. So if you look carefully, this is not picking it up very well, but lead one will be a reverse end. Just like this is a small end here, the lead one will be a reverse end. It's not seen very well in this ECG, okay? But uh, 
V5, V6 is very representative. Also, the L, uh, AVL is also looking at it from the left lateral, right? Remember that axis I showed you? So AVL is also looking from them. So look in the AVL, again in AVL you're seeing an M pattern, but predominantly V5, V6, left lateral, AVL is also left lateral, lead one is also left lateral, but one is not really catching it very well in this particular ECG. This is classical sinus rhythm with left bundle branch block. Okay, did you understand conduction problems? Yes, sir. Yeah, is yes, it clear sir. now? Yeah. Yes. So there are there are only five things that you really need to know. First degree hard block, second degree hard block, third degree hard block, left bundle branch block, and right bundle branch block. Okay, five things. That's all. It's very very easy, but but it does give you a lot of credit in the exam when you can pick this up. And these are classical things. These are not uh, uh, difficult to pick up. If you see, you have to keep seeing a lot of uh, ECGs before you become good at these things, okay? All right, let's look at P waves. There are some things of P waves that are an issue. What, will, what, what do you think a tall P wave means? What is happening in a tall P wave? Anybody wants to tell me, what does a tall P wave mean? You know, so the position is taking more time. Not more time, but more strength. More electrical activity in actual more electrical activity. activity. So what will cause more electrical activity in the atrium? More Actual stress on the atrium. No, it will more muscle. It will more, yeah. muscle. more muscle. So there is more right atrial hypertrophy. Okay, tall T wave usually represents right atrial hypertrophy. And if it's a prolonged P wave, a broad P wave with a notch in between, that means it is taking more time for the SA to go across the left and the right so it usually, when there's a broad P wave or there is a notched P wave, it usually represents left atrial hypertrophy. Okay, is it now making sense? Are you starting to understand what the textbooks tell you? Because you have now understood what is happening. Why, what does the P wave represent, okay? So let's look at some examples. Look at this one. There's a tall P wave, yeah, tall P wave. So more muscle mass. So because there is more muscle mass, this is called as right atrial hypertrophy. If you look at this one, look at this broad, the P wave is broad on, a P, on the ECG and there's a slight notch. Can you see that slight notch on the P wave? So the impulse from the right atrium is also being sensed and the extra impulse, because left atrium is enlarged, there is extra impulse on the left side. So you're getting this notched P wave. Yeah, so this broad P wave and a notched P wave always represents left atrial hypertrophy, okay? Make sense? Tall P wave, right atrial hypertrophy. Broad P wave, left atrial hypertrophy. Okay, what do you think will happen in a ventricular hypertrophy? You can come in and tell me. Depending on either right ventricular or left ventricular, it will be- Yeah, but what will happen to the QRS? Uh, it will be in tall. Tall, so increased height of the QRS complex, okay? So whenever the QRS complex is tall and high, there's increased height of a QRS complex, always think of ventricular hypertrophy. Now, if you want to look at the right ventricle, which is the best lead? Come on guys, right ventricle, just get the orientation, horizontal axis, right ventricle. V1, V1, V2. V1, V2, very simple. So if, if, if there's right ventricular hypertrophy, the tall QRS will be in V1, V2. You agree or no? Simple, it's nothing complex, okay? What do you think will, where do you look for, for left ventricular hypertrophy? V5, V6. Yeah, V5, V6, yeah, V5, V6, is it? So it's not very difficult, as long as you've understood that it's coming towards and against, and you've understood where, which side the angle, the heart is being looked at. It's, it's very easy to identify what is. So, so look at this, tall P waves, yeah? a tall QRS. Can you see this tall Q, QRS, V1, V2, and V3 as well. So that is uh, usually right ventricular hypertrophy. Yeah? If you look at this one, look at this tall QRS and V5, V6. Can you see that they're so tall that they're crashing into the uh, sign above? Yeah, this is left ventricular hypertrophy. Is it making sense? 
Yes, sir. Very easy, very easy. It's not difficult at all. Okay. So what will happen if there's broadening of a QRS? What does that mean? Some part of a I showed you earlier. Some part of a conduction problem in the. Uh, yeah. Vehicle. So there is an abnormal interventricular conduction problem, isn't it? We we saw it in the previous one. So because it is taking more time for the for the ventricular depolarization to go across the septum into the right and the left. Normally, a broadening of a QRS complex usually suggests an abnormal intraventricular conduction. And the commonest broadening, which we just discussed, is? Which one? Bundle branch block. Excellent. Bundle branch block. Okay. So bundle branch block is the commonest one, which will cause you a very widened QRS. Okay. Uh, and it's also seen in WPW. All right. Okay, so does that make sense? Is it easy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, now let's look at ST segment. Okay, so let's look at it. Let me see how many more slides are there because we are coming to end of time. I saw it. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I think we should finish this talk rather than stop at seven o'clock. Is that okay with you guys or do you want to yes, stop sir. at seven o'clock? Just finish this. It's just the last part. These are now the important ones. The MIs are coming into the picture. So ST segment, this is normal ST segment. This is elevation and this is depression. Yeah? Okay. Easy? So whenever there's ST segment elevation, think about MI or pericarditis. Okay? Very, very easy. So whenever there's ST segment elevation, you must think about uh, MI or pericardial. Pericardial inflammation can also give rise to ST segment elevation. So sometimes in myocardial infarction, you might also get uh, prominent Q waves. Uh, they're usually one centimeter across two, two millimeters deep, and they will suggest that there is MI happening, okay? So you've got to watch out for that very carefully. ST segment depression and T wave inversion usually suggest ischemia, which means that whenever there's ischemia, the atrial depolar the ventricular depolarization cannot go across and the repolarization is affected. So because that latent period increases, there is, an, there is a prolongation of the ST segment, okay? And also it can suggest ventricular hypertrophy because it's taking more time to depolarize and it is taking more time to repolarize. It can also suggest abnormal interventricular conduction problems, and sometimes dejoxing can cause these problems, okay? So remember these, these are differential diagnoses for ST segment depression, but commonest one is ischemia. So ischemia will cause ST segment uh, depression or T wave inversion, okay? So let's look at T wave inversion. Now T wave inversion is normal in three AVR and V1. So as I told you earlier, look at the diagram, and as I told you earlier, the T wave the negative starts to move away, yeah? So because the negative moves away in lead two, the negative is moving away from the positive of the lead two, there is a upward deflection, okay? So it is the repolarization, which is represented as positive in lead two, but that negative is moving towards AVR, okay? So because it's moving towards AVR, there will be a negative deflection. So it will be inverted in lead VR and also in lead V1. V1 is looking at it from this side. So negative going towards a positive will cause an inversion, okay? A negative towards a positive because it's a repolarization, it's not depolarization. So there will be inversion in VR, there will be inversion in lead one and lead three sometimes can represent as an inversion. If, if it's a little twisted, the axis is a little deviated, then it can represent T wave inversion. It might be present in bundle branch block because there is a delayed uh, uh, delay of the conduction. It also represents ischemia and it also represents ventricular hypertrophy, okay? So these are the few things that you have to remember which will cause a T wave to be abnormal. A T wave flattening or a peak with an unusually long or a short QT intervals is usually electrolyte abnormalities because P wave uh, the T wave predominantly depends on the potassium channel change uh, closing. Uh, sorry, the sodium channel closing and the potassium starting to leak out. 
Okay, the repolarization is predominantly a potassium phenomenon. So whenever you have a problem with the potassium levels, then T wave is the first one which gets affected, okay? The sodium, you don't get so often, um, uh, you know, hyponatremia and things like that. But if you have a sodium problem, then you will have a problem with depolarization. If it's a potassium problem, predominantly the potassium problem represents itself as a T wave flattening or a peaking of the T wave, okay? But minor changes are not specific. Are they non-specific? So T wave, only the uh, you know it, in association with the ST, it is a good uh, technique to help you diagnose what is going on. So let's look at this ECG. Okay, it's in front of you. Have a look at it. Uh, look at V1. Look at V2, V3. Something is going on in V1 and V2. Uh, but more importantly, look at V4, V5. Okay, look at V4, V5. Oh, what's happening in V4? So sinus rhythm, rate of AT. Axis is normal. You can calculate the axis if you want. Uh, positive, negative, positive, negative. It's a normal axis. V2 is isoelectric, so it's a normal axis. Uh, small Q waves in 2, 3, AVF, okay? So let's look into it. See this Q wave? So presence of Q wave in 2, 3, and AVF usually suggests an old infant, okay? So if there's a Q wave present, it usually suggests whole infant. But that's not the problem here. The more important problem is the elevation. Okay, look at this, ST elevation. Okay, grossly elevated from the baseline. And whenever this elevation is V3 and V4, what do they represent? V3 and V4, anterior wall. Okay, so it is an acute anterior infant that is happening. So V1, V2 represents septum. V3, V4 usually is looking at anterior, and V5 and V6 is usually looking at the left lateral, okay? All right, and V7, 8, 9, if you want, will look at the posterior part of the heart. All right, let's look at this one, all right? So this one, if you look carefully, the rhythm is sinus. If you calculate the axis, there is actually a left axis deviation in this uh, slide. So left. left axis deviation. There is Q wave in VL, V2, and V3, okay? And there's ST elevation in VL, V2 to V5. Look carefully. There is ST elevation, yeah? There's something going on here. But it is being sustained through V4 and V5, yeah? So this ST elevation, particularly in lead one as well. So lead one is showing it. VL, which is looking at the right side of the heart, yeah, uh, which is looking at the left side of the heart is also showing this, and V2, V3, and going into V4 is anterolateral in fact. So there's anterior also, and it's going towards the lateral side as well. So there are changes all along, so it's an anterolateral in fact. So you've got to add more and more leads to make a diagnosis, but first, Predominantly zoom into one lead, understand what's happening in one lead, and then add the extra leads to see whether is it extending beyond the anterior going into the lateral, okay? So look at this one. This one is sinus rhythm. The rate is 70. Axis is normal. There is Q wave in lead two, three, and VF, yeah? Q wave formed, uh, where is my marker? So Q wave formed in lead two, three, and VF, yeah, something is going on there. QRS complex looks normal, but the ST is elevated in lead two, three, and VF. ST is elevated, elevated, lead two, three, and VF. And if you look at lead two, lead two is looking this way, lead three is coming from here, okay, and VF is looking, all of these three leads, lead two is at the angle of the heart apex and looking downwards, Lead uh, the, from the foot, you're looking downwards. And from lead three also, you're looking downwards. So this is more likely to be an, uh, a lat acute inferior infarction, okay? It's an acute inferior infarction. This is inferior infarction. Two, three, and VF is usually looking at the base of the heart. So this is a inferior infarction, okay? All right. Let's look at this one. Can you see this? Tell me what you're finding. 
sign of rhythm, the rate is about 70 per minute when you calculate. The axis is okay, but in R wave, uh, there is a dominant R wave in lead V1. The R wave is dominant in lead V1. There's a flattened uh, in lead one. Okay, the T wave is flattened. Yeah. And in VL as well, there's a problem. There's flat. There's no T wave seen here. Can you see that? There's no T wave seen here. So this is usually a posterior MI because one and uh, uh, VL are looking at it from the side, left lateral. So in this situation, what I will do is I will actually put lead seven, eight, and nine, okay? Because you cannot clearly see the ST changes, but you're seeing some flattening of the leads in lead one and lead two. So there's a subtle hint that something is going on beyond the left lateral. So something is going on beyond, there's no T wave seen in lead two, no T wave seen, sorry, in lead one and VL. So something is happening beyond the left lateral side. So in this situation, what I would do is I would put lead seven, eight, and nine. And when you put lead seven, eight, and nine, what you will see is ST elevation. So the ST, so this is uh, ECG, which is giving you a hint that something is going on beyond the left lateral. So in a normal ECG, you're not able to pick up the ST elevation, but definitely T waves are lost here. So this is an indication for putting seven, eight, and nine. And when you put seven, eight, and nine, you will see ST elevation, and that will give you a diagnosis of posterior MI, okay? Let's look at this one. Okay, anybody wants to take it, or I'm happy to go through it. So the upper tracing is showing heart rate of 55. The ST is isoelectric, correct? The lower tracing is after exercise. Can you see that? So this is normal at rest, and this is after exercise. So at rest, he was okay. But the moment he started to exercise, there is depression of the ST. Can you see that? This is depression of the ST. So this is not infarcting, but this is ischemia. Okay, this is ischemia. So this is exercise-induced ischemia. So this is uh, the way to identify the ST depression gives you an indication that there is ischemia in this patient when he's starting to exercise. Okay, so let's go through this one. Uh, the sinus rhythm, rate of 62. Access is normal. QRS is normal. There is some inversion in T wave, in V2, uh, in V3 and V4. See this? V4 T wave is starting to get inverted, okay? And actually, there is biphasic waves in V2 and V5. So V2, look at this. Can you see this? Biphasic wave in V2 and also in V5. There's a biphasic wave, a T and a depression. Okay? So this is again suggesting to you that the, there is some problem with the myocardium, but there is no elevation of the ST. There is no elevation of the ST anywhere. So there is no ST elevation, but there is definitely some problems with the repolarization here. Can you see that the repolarization is affected? Something strange is happening here. And this is again, a classical indication of non-ST elevation MI, okay? So when you get inverted T waves in V3, okay? That's important to understand. Inverted T waves or biphasic T waves are an indication that you are actually having an MI, but this is called as a non-ST elevation MI, okay? And because this is happening in lead two and three, okay, and four as well, more likely to be anterior. The area that is being affected is the anterior part of the chest wall, of the myocardium. So this is anterior part of the myocardium, and it is going towards the lateral as well, starting to go towards the lateral because V5 is also starting to show some biphasic changes in the T wave, okay? So this is the way you pick up. Now, this is uh, another one which I will just talk about it. Where am I? I can't even see. This is classical of pulmonary embolism, and this is something which you just uh, have to see a few of these. I want you to see a few of these before you can answer this. So I, I put this slide up there for you. 
uh, go back to any internet site and look for pulmonary embolism. And when you look for pulmonary embolism, you will always get right axis deviation because the right side is affected. This right arch strain because the embolus has gone into the pulmonary artery. So the right ventricle is straining against a uh, blood clot in the pulmonary artery. So you will get right axis deviation, a tall peak T wave. Look at this, look at this T wave. So this is indicating that there is something wrong with the right atrium, okay? There's a problem with the right atrium. Either there is a hypertrophy or there is increased strain. So a tall peak T wave on the right atrium uh, and a persistent S wave in V6. Look at this persistent S wave in V6. All of this suggests that there is a problem with the myocardium. Again, a T wave inversion. Look here, T wave inversion in V2, V3. So this ad is having some trouble pumping the blood against a clot. There's something that is stopping and most of it is predominantly on the right side or on the septum. So V1 is also showing a change. V2 is showing a change. So a right heart strain, a right axis deviation, a tall peak T wave, all three put together is equal to pulmonary embolism. You need to see a few of these to actually identify these, okay? So it's very, very important that you keep seeing a few to identify. Now, just quickly, three or four slides, quickly to look at revision of what we have discussed so far, just three or four slides, okay? So let's, let me just tell you, so depolarization starts in the SA node, spreads to the ventricular via the AV node, the bundle of his, the right bundle and the left bundle branch, and then anterior and posterior fascicle of the left bundle branch. I have not put in the anterior and posterior fascicle ECGs. These are all more complicated for cardiologists to understand. For us as surgeons, we just need to be able to identify MI. We need to be able to identify what is the region of the MI that is a problem. We need to be able to identify whether the septum is a problem. We need to know whether there's a conduction block we need to know whether it's a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, or if it's a first degree or second degree or third degree block. And then the rhythm problems we need to be able to identify. Atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, ventricular uh, tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. These are the main rhythm problems. And the one extra we put in is called as uh, uh, WPW, uh, classic findings on these things. So that's why I put that extra in there. So the, uh, not, you know, you really don't need to go into the depot, into the details. We said that the septum depolarizes from left to right. Uh, always lead V1 looks at the right ventricle, V6 looks at the left ventricle. Uh, when depolarization spreads towards an electrode, the stylus moves upwards. Uh, if the conduction is normal through the AV node, the base and one of its branches, and it is abnormal in the other branch, then the QRS complex becomes wide. We did that earlier in the course. Uh, conduction problem in the AV node and his bundle may be first degree or second degree or third degree, okay? Thank you very much. Now I've got about 30, 40 ECGs, which I don't think I will show you now, but this is for another revision lecture where I will show you the ECG and you will diagnose for me. Uh, what is the problem? So my first point was to give the lecture. And then next point was when we discuss in another session, I can throw the ECG at you. And I want you to look at the ECG and I want you to tell me what is the diagnosis. Okay? All right. Thank you very much, guys. Let me stop. Stop share. Stop recording. All right. So did that make sense? Was it too exhaustive or was it boring or what? Perfectly I mean, into the context. Yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult for us to do a medical topic as surgeons, but I tried to orient it in a way that it would be of interest to the surgeons. That, that is the whole idea. This is not to teach the, you know, not to I teach think, the cardiologists. I think so even MBBS students, third MBBS students will yeah, look MBBS. at the video, they will benefit yeah, from M this. Of course, MBBS okay. also. So yeah, the idea was MBBS and, uh, and uh, surgeons, not cardiologists. <laughs> we don't want to make anybody into a cardiologist, okay? So let me just stop the relay.